<laughs> um, in, in, in any event, so uh, I do think that when has a project, if they don't have somebody in hand to do it, it's one of the that job is reasonable. But that's not really what's going on. It certainly has evolved. Into, into, into an animal of its own. Yeah. And what it may be, what I see in I would just like to say before we start, um, two things. One is we're supposed to speak into the microphones, uh, which is kind of okay. unnecessary if you've got a loud voice, but uh, whoa. <laughs> um, before we start, I'd just like to say uh, for the third year MR students, today is going to be a lot more fun than last time we were together in this room. I guarantee you. Okay. <laughs> last time we were together was for their final exam. Oh, no. um, okay. We, this is the beginning of a series that you said you wanted, um, and not in so many words, but you, you've all been saying on your evaluations and, and through the year um, that you really wanted to hear more from people who are actually out there doing it in a big way, um, and how to change the profession from all the problems that we've talked about to a better outcome. So uh, we are, the, the dean was very enthusiastic about doing this. Um, and suggested, in fact, being much more political person than I, uh, he suggested that we do this this year so that it's, if it's a big success, uh, the new dean will have to keep doing it, um, which I thought was pretty clever. Um, uh, but that's not ever been one of Mark's shortcomings, being smart about things. Um, so uh, this is the first of three uh, events um, with each of the three major parties who get things built. And we were just talking about a fourth party uh, that we may discuss at the end. Um, and we're very lucky to have the three people who are sitting next to me here um, who run three of the most important and biggest uh, construction companies, um, certainly in the Northeast and in one case all over the world. So just a very brief introduction. And these are all, by the way, people that I've been lucky enough to work with um, over the last 20 plus years. Um, doing projects uh, uh, for, for me, um, so I know them all very well, and um, they are perfect examples of really smart, really competent, really experienced contractors that if you have a complicated job, or even any job, um, you will be very lucky to work with a firm that really knows how to build things. Because if you've ever worked with a firm that doesn't know how to build things, uh, the pain is uh, beyond beyond oral surgery without anesthesia, beyond anything you can think of. Um, so these guys do make you look good, and they are all good to work with. So immediately on my left is Joe Mizzi, who's the president of Siami, um, uh, with whom we renovated Columbia Law School building and added a floor. Um, larger projects they've done include the uh, new FDR memorial, 
um, on, on Roosevelt Island. And if you haven't been out to see it, you really must. And marvel at the pieces of granite there and marvel at the hairline space between them that is so perfect you can't believe it was actually built by human beings. Um, and they also did the, um, uh, and that's the Lucan project, of course. Uh, and they also did the, um, the uh, uh, Morgan Library for Renzo Piano, uh, building workshop, and also quite an amazing project. Um, next is Joe Capitelli, who is the vice chairman of Structure Tone, a three and a half billion dollar a year company. Uh, that is a lot of construction every year. Um, all over the world, um, they've done major projects in, in every city that you've ever heard of and probably a lot that you have not heard of. Um, and in New York, they uh, are currently doing the uh, uh, restoration and renovation of St. Patrick's Cathedral, a $250 million project with uh, uh, Murphy Buttrick Burnham, uh, a firm that has a new name, which I usually get wrong. Um, and they also did for Cook and Fox, one of the most energy uh, efficient um, uh, projects in New York, the uh, Bank of America building on Bryant Park. Um, and they are the world's largest contractor of interior construction uh, in the world, um, with offices, as I say, all over the place. Um, finally is an old friend, Stu Koshner, uh, who's the uh, uh, managing partner, or I, I don't know what your title is exactly. Oh, he's, he, he, he's the co-head of, uh, uh, of a terrific firm, R.C. Dolner, um, that did the renovation of Lincoln Center uh, for Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro, and uh, is currently doing, uh, uh, has done for a long time, and is doing right now the outside uh, fountain work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, on Fifth Avenue for Kevin Roach. <coughs> That's okay, right. okay. So, and uh, with, with Joe, we, we um, have done work for various George Soros offices for the last 15, 20 years. And with Stu, we renovated both Brooklyn Friends in, in Brooklyn and um, uh, Cardozo Law School down on Fifth Avenue. So I've had great experience with all of these guys. So why don't we just jump in? And I think the first question, you know, since these three parties really have to work together, harmoniously to get things done, and each one needs something very specific from the other two. Um, why don't we jump in first with what are, what do you view as the key elements of what you need from architects to make their projects come out as they intended? And since you're sitting right next to me, Joe, <laughs> okay. um, I'll let you jump in and start. Sure. Um, so I think for us working with architects, um, and trying to build things. Um, collaboration is important. Um, I think the best projects we've built have had a collaborative relationship between the architect and the CM uh, contractor. Um, I think there's a pattern developing in, in our industry with the development of construction documents. Uh, I think we need proper documents. And you know, I, I, I studied architecture, so I, I know a little bit about arch architectural education, and I don't know that it's the viewpoint of architectural institutions teaching arch architecture to train um, uh, strongly on the technical side of preparing documents, but you know, communication and communicating how you want something built uh, as an architect um, is key because if we don't understand, A, what you're trying to build, and B, um, uh, uh, what's important to you, uh, we can't we can't do it so I think we need we need that information conveyed to us um, and I think personally uh, we need a level of respect and 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 and, and um, uh, uh, openness you know a lot, I, I find sometimes architects think that contractors are there to um, cut a corner uh, or not give you what you're trying to do and so they're not always as forthcoming in telling you what's important to them and what's not important to them, um, because the moment you, you know, th they might perceive that the moment you, you are conveying something is less important that we're looking at as a reason to get it 
off the table or out of the job. And I think our best, again, our best projects that we've built when there's been an open, collaborative, trusting relationship where we know what you're looking for, know how uh, you'd like it to be built, and you're also willing to respect us and understand when we're giving you advice um, or our input that it may be to really um, make it more successful, not to, not to cut a corner or save money. Um, and I think when I worked with Renzo Piano's office on the Morgan Library, the, the converse view is the architect would start to ask us how we're going to build something. And you know, working in New York City with other architects, you, you, when someone says, an uh, architect says, how are you going to build it? You, you recoil for a second, you're like, uh, uh, why do you want to know? Uh, <laughs> but I realized that they really wanted to know because they wanted to work together with us to find the best solution. And once we started, they started asking me, they were detailing stuff on the drawings. They said, look, we know how to detail this in, 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 in Paris and in, in, in Genoa, but we don't really know how it might be made in New York. Could you give me some input on the detailing of the, of the millwork details? And so I think when, when, when the architect is comfortable with their place in the, in the process and the, and the contractor is as well, um, it makes for the best uh, success. So long answer, but hopefully that's uh, a... <laughs> you, you're each allowed half an hour per answer. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Well, we're in the... We do more corporate interiors, large corporate interior projects, two, three, four hundred, sometimes six, seven hundred thousand foot corporate installations. That's a typical type of work, uh, you know, uh, and hotels and things like that. But I think young architects have to understand that architecture is a business. And at some point, you're going to have to make a living with architecture. And clients today are very, very driven, budget driven, cost conscious. Uh, it sort of drives every, every major project today. Uh, so we re you really need to focus on really coordinated and complete documents, as Joe said. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's really a very, very important factor in starting a project off so everyone's on the same page. And budgets are extremely, really important. Well, knowing how to design to, a, to the budget that's created. I think that's a real key thing today because uh, I'll tell you out there today, everything, everything is being driven in these large corp corporations today by uh, corporate purchasing people, corporate sourcing people. So even the real estate and construction and architectural experts that are maybe involved in a project, they still have to adhere to these to the, to the budget constraints of the project. So the coordinated, complete documents are really, really a key to starting a project off. You know, I mean, construction is a business of problems, but you have less problems when you, when you start off with good documents. Stu? Well, I can't agree any more with what the two Joes have, have, have said. Teamwork is absolutely a key. If, if the group isn't working together, the entire design team, not just the architect, the other uh, consultants as well, and the construction firm, um, it's doomed for failure. You know, one of the problems in today's world are attorneys. And I don't think I've seen a contract that I've had in the last 20 years where we weren't given the responsibility to manage the design time for the architect, review the drawings for constructability, be responsible for making sure that uh, all of the DOB, fire department, municipal filings are done in a timely manner, um, and any other possible review that one could ask us of the architect. So I think attorneys are pressing clients to make sure that there's an adversarial relationship between the design team, the client, and the construction firm, so that hopefully out of that mess comes the best challenge and the best possible project. Now that's where the teamwork comes in. So what we try to do is, is do that due diligence work quietly behind the scenes. We review our drawings, we'll sit down, the, the architect's drawings, the engineer's drawings, we will sit down quietly with, with the design team to understand the project, go through the details. What are we interested in? If it's a new building, we want to make sure that when the facade goes on the building that there's a little bit of flexibility in play so that you can attach the facade properly to the building, that there's vertical and in and out expansion, 
at, so that the building can be built. Um, I remember <clears throat> one of my first interior projects, I was dealing with a young fellow from Guafney Siegel, and we had a terrazzo floor, we had an aluminum slat ceiling, and we had a tile wall. And this young fellow sat there on the floor, marking to a 64th of an inch how all of these lines would intersect. And I asked him to get up, and I asked him to give me his pencil, and I just broke it into six pieces. And I said, we don't work to a 64th of an inch. So let's start there. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that <laughs> there's got to be some common sense that takes place in this. And, and I think all of us have to understand what is it that the client wants. I mean, the three important things about construction, and these guys will agree, are cost, schedule, and quality. Sometimes all three are paramount. Sometimes one of the three takes precedent, or two of the three. That has to be figured out, and you have to make sense of it all and proceed accordingly. What, what I say, Stu, actually, is that there's a fourth. And when a client is uh, uh, enumerating their hierarchy of, of issues, their priority of issues, they really have to put in the fourth. Um, and this is where you guys probably should be getting a lot of work, which is risk. Um, how much of a risk are they willing to take with the other three? And if their appetite for risk is very low, get ready to spend more money to reduce the risk. And, 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 and for, for solid contractors, this is, I think, the best argument. Well, I, I'm seeing clients, at least the, the clients that are uh, doing construction on, on a more regular basis, understand the word contingency. And I'm not sure to what degree our audience understands it, but when, when a budget is put together at a conceptual stage, typically at the bottom line, there will be a design contingency and a construction contingency. And, you know, that could be 10% for each. It could be 15 and 15. depends upon the nature of the project. As the design gets closer and closer to completion, those numbers reduce. But a client, at the end of the day, has to maintain a decent contingency because cost overruns and issues come up, and unforeseen conditions arise, and, um, and, and you're right, risk, and you gotta be risk averse, and you gotta be smart. Well, some clients are very, you know, some clients who, who in my experience at least, um, where, where money is the key thing, um, are willing to take a bigger risk um, to try to save money, and in, in my experience, quite frankly, it's usually a really bad bet, <laughs> because where they, where they see the, the option of, of saving money is by getting a less experienced, less qualified contractor, and they always end up paying more in the end than they would have had they bitten the bullet early, reduced their risk, and hired a better quality contractor. I feel like I'm a salesman for you guys. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, I, I, I think, you know, just, just going, well, maybe it's more about the future. When you talk about documents, um, we are all a little frustrated by the fact that, by and large, we produce these incredible documents, you know, incredibly data-rich and precise, and, and these incredible electronic files. And what do we do with them? We basically uh, turn them into paper the way you, you were used to getting it 50 years ago. Maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, uh, what, what steps are you taking to be able to utilize the data-rich files we give you in ways other than the way you would have used a plain old paper file. Other, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, we see, we, right. we see some duck work and some very limited things, some no work being done uh, right. with direct utilization, but right. is there something much better in the future? Well, um, I think your point's well taken that, you know, I think what's frustrating to architects and contractors as well is Architects are taking a lot of time to, and engineers and consultants, as, as was mentioned, to produce a very detailed set of documents with very specific details. Curtain wall is a good example. Yeah. Architects are spending a lot of time, energy, and money to detail a curtain wall system. When, in reality, the you know any curtain wall system of significance, uh, non-standard system, is a proprietary system that is engineered, designed, fabricated, and installed by a third party, a curtain wall manufacturer uh, in that case. Um, so, but I think what's behind that, it's architects wanting to make sure the design gets executed. It's this, uh, you know, probably getting into the contracts that was mentioned by Stu, 
litigation and risk and responsibility and liability of I want to have a set of documents that is very prescriptive so that if I get accused of being the person designing this, I can point to what I required for my documents. Um, this design to fabrication concept, which it, it, it exists, but you know, realist, uh, on, on a commercial scale that we're working on very little, um, we did a, a prefabricated building, uh, a small building for MoMA as part of a, a, home, a home exhibition where we did design to um, fabrication. But really that would require, and it, it goes back to a point that I touched on and, and that Stu touched on, which is, no, and Joe, uh, the, the documents themselves. We're worried about getting enough you know, documents to, to interpret and build from, and that relies on a set of documents that you can actually fabricate off of. Not that it's not possible, but that, that's, that's, a, that's a, to me, a direction um, uh, in the industry that, that is possible, but I think currently the way we're headed, it's not, we're not headed in that direction, I don't think. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I jotted down, I was thinking about, um, you asked about the documents. We've been exploring this blue beam technology and using it on some of our larger projects where the documents, you, we buy for our field office a screen that's almost the size of a set of drawings and the PDF, it's, it relies on PDF documents, but basically the drawing set is, uh, is updated onto an electronic file where the superintendent looks at the drawings through by looking at a large screen. And when the drawings are amended, the details get amended. So in that case, the field office, the days of having the architect sign the paper drawing and make sure it was updated, we're not, we, we're using paperless documentation in that, in that respect. So that's what I'm seeing. Okay, we'll come back to the future because I'm pretty interested in that. But before we do, um, <laughs> as kind of the, you know, the, the third party watching the other two parties, um, what, what do you see certain architects do that makes their clients keep coming back? Well, I think the, you really have to know, you put your client's uh, needs before your own vision. I think you have to know what the client wants and have an understanding of what the client's needs and vision is first. Uh, because again, it comes back to dollars. So I think that's very important, clearly understanding that. And what's happening in the type of work we do is that the, the uh, corporate office use is shrinking because the cost of real estate and rents is so high. So the days of the big, large corporate corner offices with the wood panel, that's all gone today. I mean, CEOs sit in small, window cubicles today, or, you know, small, smaller environment. So the corporations are trying to pack as many people into a smaller space. And most of this space is technology driven. I mean, there's benching now where people don't even have cubicles anymore. People sit like this next to each other. And this is a corp typical corporate office environment today. So uh, construction and design for the corporate world is really, really going through a big change, and it's all technology driven. So I think that's something that you know is, is really you know paramount today. I, I, I guess this question is a little geared for the question after it, which is what do you see architects do? And we won't name any names here because that's a little <laughs> out of bounds, and I, you you guys are have too much good taste and sense to do that. But I know, Stu, you, you, I, I had lunch with you not too long ago, and you were bending my ear about some project that was heading south at a very fast rate, and how <laughs> incredibly stupid the architect was being, and how that's probably a client who would never even want to talk to that architect it again. It ended up coming 360, believe it or not. Yeah, good. <laughs> how? Well, well, first of all, describe, <laughs> describe what was going wrong, and describe how it turned around. Again, without names or... We, we were hired to do kind of an interactive public space where an architect was already on board. Our first meeting was a schematic design presentation to the client, and it went exceedingly well. And the marching orders that we were given was the architect was designing to a $7 million budget, 
and we were handed the drawings and asked to come back with a budget. We did a few weeks later, and it was $18 million. And a crisis took place. And the architect dug his heels in, and after a month or two, it was maybe we should change the architect. Um, what are your thoughts and ideas? The architect went back and said, give me an opportunity to, to redo this. I understand what you want. Could we have a little bit more money? Sure. Okay, now the budget's $13 million. Okay. Six, eight weeks later, a new set of drawings came out. We budgeted. The architect had an independent budget uh, estimator do a budget. Our numbers were in a half a million dollars of each other, $21, $22 million. And at that point, uh, they were fit to be tied. Once again, the architect, and, and, and this, there was one other thing that I'll never forget. The architect changed the ceiling and the lighting design dramatically. And at the presentation to the client, the client took one look at the reflected ceiling plan and said, why did you change the design? I like the other. And the architect rather sternly said, this is much better. You're going to like it. I thought there was going to be a fist fight. I honestly thought two grown men were going to end up in a fist fight. Well, fast forward. Somehow we got past the budget problems. The design was implemented pretty much as the architect wanted it. And about 80% of the way through construction, the client and I happened to be at the site at the same time. He looked up at the ceiling, looked at me, and said, the architect was right, I was wrong. I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen a situation so where- So don't count on it happening again is what you're really saying. <laughs> very, very uncommon. You, usually, if there's that much bad blood, it ends pretty quickly. But and not happily. And not happily. Not happily. Look, I, I think the architect is usually there first. Understand what the client is looking for. And again, it's quality, it's schedule, it's budget, and architects have as much a responsibility on those three elements as the construction group does. And if we work together, we can figure it out. Joe was talking a little bit about curtain wall. I can't begin to how many can't begin to tell you how many projects we've done where the architect prepared a concept set of facade drawings. We then brought in several different curtain wall manufacturers. Each made a design build approach. I'm sure, Joe, you've done the same thing yep. because it is proprietary. Series of interviews, meetings, maybe shop visits, and then you pick the one that's right for the job. There's tons of different ways to skin the cat. But as far as engineering, and Everything's CAD today. Everything is three-dimensional. It's the, the world is certainly changing it. In that well, area. these guys know more about that stuff, mm. um, and, and particularly that guy sitting right there with the glasses on his head. <coughs> these guys know more about that stuff than most architects in practice, because they, they're really at the front cutting edge. Um, but, but going back to why clients hire architects, what, what else have you seen? Um, that, that surprised you or, or whatever about why they did or didn't hire an architect. Um, I mean, I've heard stories. I'm not obviously at the receiving end of a whole lot of those stories. You've probably seen more. I, I don't know, Joe. Well, they hire an architect, A, because they probably have seen projects the architect has done. I mean, it is, it is design, and everyone wants good design, but they want affordable design. So uh, I think the first thing is they have to be attracted to that architect because he has a track record doing good, good quality design. Uh, but the, as, again, the architect, at, after he gets past that, they have to really listen to the client and understand his needs because sometimes the design does not, co does not coordinate with the needs of the client. So there has to be a happy medium. It's you know it's a business of give and take. You know it's a, it's a process. Well, again, without yeah. naming names because that's yeah. out of bounds in my view. Um, you have told me stories about uh, an architect that we both know, right. very famous, uh, and you got him an introduction to a client. He did a design and and uh, uh, introduced a material, that, and, the, and the client mm -hmm. said, "Well, I just don't like that." And then the architect said, "You I know, mean, it, it was." literally six fleet feet of glass block. And the client was a major bank. And he loved the design, he loved everything, but he said, I have an aversion to glass block. He said, it reminds me of a bathroom. So he says, just change that material. And we 
have a project. It was a couple hundred thousand foot headquarters for a bank. He refused to take his glass block out of the design. <laughs> he lost the job. <laughs> okay, a certain degree of flexibility is required. You need flexibility. And, and also keep in mind that in, in terms of design, there often is no right or wrong. Um, and a lot of people have very strong emotional reactions um, as that client did to certain things. And you know, you can't leave emotions out of the discussion because people are emotional uh, and, and you know, if, if they have strong emotions about something, um, listen. I don't know, Jeff. No, I, I, I think a lot of the points that were mentioned uh, uh, are, are right. Um, I, what happens, our clients tend to talk to the architects about the contractor and clients tend to talk to the contractor about their architects and it's, 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 it's natural. And I, and I, and I, have, I have been told, uh, to Joe's point, on, on many occasions that sometimes clients really feel like they're being asked to, you know, th you know basically pay for the design and construction of something that they, they don't want they didn't ask for what they don't like, you know, to, 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 to Stu's point. Um, to, to Joe's point about, about budget, I think the best architects have an understanding of a relationship, of the relationship between what they're designing and what it costs. It doesn't need to be perfect. I mean, it's very hard for us to take something at, at, at an early design level and just tell you exactly what it's going to cost, but when you know, I, I found you know, w w the best architects are interested in how something goes together, what it costs, and how it relates to what the client wants, thinks they want, doesn't think they want. And it's okay. I mean, I think a good architect can persuade a customer to incorporate something that maybe they, you know, maybe they ultimately will like to the, to the story that was uh, about the ceiling. Um, that can be addressed in mock-ups, both we built things via mock-up that have helped make it better. We've built things via mock-up that have had customers say, I don't want that. Or an architect say, did I really design that? I mean, that, is, that what, is that what I designed and now I'm seeing it and I don't like it? And if they can say it with a mock-up that's temporary, it's a lot, they're not gonna say it in this finished room, they're gonna keep it to themselves. Um, so that's, that's to me, you know, part of communication, but uh, I, I think really attending to, listening, understanding what the client wants, and then proceeding from there, even if your, your objective is to persuade them in a different direction, I, I think a lot of architects do not listen to their clients as, you know, exam, you know in Joe's case, he mentioned that as well. Yeah. You have to also remember that the cost of these projects, 50% of the cost of these projects is in the MEPS trades, mechanical, electrical, uh, so you really have to have a real understanding of what your engineer is doing and you know and so you have to be you know very attuned to that because it, it's half the cost of the jobs today is, is is not the architectural trades it's the mechanical trades so it's it's it it's a, has a big impact on on the, the client's budget now if if you think you're hearing about architects not listening to the clients if you think you're hearing this from the contractor we're probably going to get an earful about this in two weeks when we listen to the owners. Um, <laughs> in, in, in any event, it, Joe, you had a, a, an interesting uh, uh, experience that not too many of us, not too many contractors have had of trying to build the vision of an architect very revered but long gone. Right, right. Um, that, yeah. That's the Lucan FDR yeah. Memorial Project, obviously. Yeah. and. Um, and, and it was also built in a scale, you mentioned the big block that nobody's building today. In fact, Todd Williams, uh, the architect from Todd, Todd Williams and Billy Chen, he likes to design, if, if a typical ar architect is using one and, a, one and three quarter inch or two inch stone, he likes to go to a four inch module, you know, because he likes to, so I brought him out there to, when uh, the project was, was under construction and he saw a six foot by six foot by 12 foot piece of stone that weighs uh, 32 tons. So 64, How did you get 64, that there? 64,000 pounds. Um, 
And he goes, that's the scale I want to design it from that. I said, I feel bad for his next client. He's going to be, he's a persuasive guy. He's going to be convincing his client they want that. Um, no, but um, I think for us, part of that was how do you take somebody's vision from another time, to your point, even though it was built, designed in the early 70s, that's, that's the type of construction that was done long before, um, even before Stu started. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, but we, um, uh, we really spent a lot of time on logistics. So we, we figured out both how do we quarry stone, get it, and this, and we looked at a bunch of quarries, but that particular quarry that was, uh, that uh, was selected, the material is from North, North Carolina. We trucked, it to North, we trucked it from North Carolina to New Jersey. Um, to make things complicate things, there is a bridge, um, uh, one bridge that goes on to Roosevelt Island that has a very limited capacity. So a truck with more than one of those stones on it really should not be brought over the bridge. So we came up with a barging approach to load the truck, the stones onto barges, to bring it out via barge um, adjacent to the island, to offload them with a crane that was on the barge. And then we had delivered a, a larger crane and set it on site and began the process of setting stone. But um, I think for, for us, we just spent a lot of time thinking about, to your reference earlier, you know, how will human beings um, assemble this stone? And, and we, we, we spent a lot of time with the uh, erector, uh, you know, the, 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 the team at uh, Port Morris, Tyler Marble, and their team that was actually doing the erection came up with some interesting ideas, uh, temporary ways of um, harnessing the stone at the top and with drilled fasteners that then could be removed and, 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 and patched and, and would remain unseen at the end of the job. But I think we, you know, we, we really looked at what the outcome that the architect was trying to achieve using something that's not done today. And then we, we really looked at the steps using what's available to us today to get it to where it needs to be, and and and, um, and, and that, was, that was really how we focused on it. You, you, you touch on something that I've um, been a big proponent of, and, and those of you who are third year um, probably get a little tired of me saying this. Um, I've, I've been very, um, uh, I guess the word that you, you, you would probably use is strident. Um, I, I've been very uh, uh, strong about the notion that with the education they've got, that there are a lot of other things to do, and I think that this is a perfect example of uh, how working with a contractor, working for or at a contractor, um, can require a great deal of creativity, imagination to get things done. Um, and I've also been a big proponent of, you know, that they should think about applying for jobs to contractors. I, this is not a job fair, by the way. Um, uh, applying to contractors because in, in my experience with many of you, many of you hire architects uh, for these very reasons. I would say almost half of, we have about a staff of, in the New York office of almost 500 people and out of that maybe we have 40, 50 project managers. I would say half of them are licensed registered architects. So a lot of architects do go into the, onto the construction side for a career. So. Uh, they also happen to make some of the best project managers we have because they have a good discipline. And uh, I really am a proponent of, I think every architectural student or every architect should spend six months or a year working for a construction company so they actually understand the practical nature or the practical application of what they're gonna be doing because uh, I think it's very important to understand how these jobs go together, what it takes to create, to create a building, to create a space, and you really get that in the field. I think uh, one of the problems, a lot of architects don't spend a lot of time uh, walking the jobs, uh, understanding you know, the process. And I think that's something architects should really be required to do, spend time at, with the construction, uh, in the construction site for, you know, not a long period of time, yeah. but so they understand it anyway. It, it's not just walking the job. Uh, still to this day, after doing this for 40 some odd years, when, when I walk a job, I want to meet the foreman of each trade. I want to ask him how he's going to go about doing his work. I want to, I, I ask him whether or not there are any issues or problems. I want to see it through his eyes. I want to see from the, from the guy who's actually going to do the work and how he sets his crew up, what are the logistics, 
how it all fits together. And I do this on every job that I'm on. So, you know, when I walk a job, it's not just looking at the quality and whether we're on schedule or whether there are issues. It's uh, making sure that th the guys that are out there with their tools have what they need and it works and it makes sense. And every now and then, an architect or an engineer that was involved in the design is at my side and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. So I think having an architect do that walkthrough is, is an excellent idea. Joe, you're ahead. By, by the way, Frank Siami you know, went to architecture school just to put that out there. Yeah. Which he loves to tell architects, by the way. But <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I went to architecture school as well. Um, uh, yeah, we're probably, I'd say a large portion of our firm are design professionals. Some come in through architecture and some come in through engineering. We do have people that have a formal construction management education, people that have worked up um, through trades. We have a number of trades people who have um, carpenters and, and, and steam fitters that have become senior uh, people in our company. But uh, if, if you're, I think, um, I, I love architecture. Um, I'm not a designer. I worked for an architect for about eight months and I didn't really love it um, in terms of preparing documents. But the benefits, and again, not, 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 not trying to convert people to construction management, but I've worked with Tom Main, Renzo Piano, two projects with the the folks from SANA, uh, Mr. Maki, a uh, Pritzker Prize winner. So it, it, there are, you know, Norman Foster, uh, 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 Stephen Hall, and there are, it's an opportunity in construction management, and, and both Joe and Stu get that same opportunity. You get a lot of respect from good architects being a builder and being the builder executing the vision of that architect. Um, and uh, Paul, had given us that level of respect on the projects that we worked on. And um, to me, it represents a really great opportunity to be involved in very, you know, directly with the design profession and not be tied down to a particular firm, individual, style, whatever it may be. Um, and, and so I find it very gratifying and I feel that I know, like, when, it, when we finished the Morgan Library, Renzo Piano was, was extremely grateful uh, for our work and for my work it was individually and specifically. Um, and it was very gratifying. So are we designing architecture? No. Are we helping realize architects' visions? Yes. And that's, that's to me, if that's, if that's your interest, uh, it's far better than being, in my mind, than being the person assigned to construction administration in an architecture firm, if that's not your interest. There are people who really enjoy that, tra you, know, tra you know, translating their firm's vision to, to the construction process, but it's very different being the builder responsible, and so I, I find it very gratifying. You know, design doesn't end when a set of drawings are complete. In many respects, it first starts. Let's talk about something, you know, let's talk about a new building. Um, Let's assume that the site is already cleared. Now you have to excavate and put a foundation in. It's a tremendous amount of logistical engineering that has to take place. You're probably up against an adjoining building in New York and you have to stabilize that building. You may have to do underpinning. You certainly have to sheet and shore and hold back the earth. There's a tremendous amount of design, engineering design that goes into that trade. If it's a structural steel building, the structural engineer designs the members, doesn't design any of the connections. Every single connection in that entire building where two pieces meet is designed by the fabrication shop who's going to manufacture it. Somebody has to sit there and do the calculations and, and, and create that. Curtain wall. It's a tremendous amount of design that takes place by the uh, company that's going to do it. Steel stairs. The engineering and the design is done by the, the contractor, the subcontractor that's doing the work. Um, light gauge framing, again, engineering that's required. All spelled out the specifications that, that your team prepares. So there's, this, there's a significant amount of engineer, engineering that falls to our side of the table that we're responsible for doing as well, including any temporary work. How do you put a hoist in there? How do you set the building up to accept the crane? 
city of New York now wants almost all cranes off the streets and into the building. So now you have to engineer the building to accept this crane. You've got to put it on a platform that's stable enough for it to support the crane. So there's a tremendous amount on our side of the table as well. And I find that, that our engineering doesn't end until the project is complete. One other thing that you you know you mentioned um, about architects <coughs> should all work on the site for a while. Um, a, a number of architects or architect students have said to me over the years, well, I, I'd be interested in working for a contractor, but I, I'm just afraid how it's going to look on my resume. And I've always said, it's going to look great on your resume. Any architecture firm with half a brain uh, is going to say, Here's somebody who knows something about construction. He's going to be a better architect employee at an architecture firm. So I, I think it's the reverse of what many people start out thinking. I can't disagree. I can't agree more. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of a, a lot of what we see when, when we work with an architect doing pre-construction and, and we're there from day one, working on arm, arm and arm. Sometimes you can't put on paper all of the details that are necessary to finish to, to actually do the construction. So we'll work with the architect and, and suggest we'll work together. You know, let's just throw the spirit of what you want on there, and then we'll work the details out in the field. I can't begin to how many times at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with interior funky details. I've had a carpenter foreman, a steam fiddle foreman, a tin knocker foreman, and the architect all working together. Let's, let, let's figure out how we're going to build this. In some cases, you're going to do a mock-up. In other cases, you know, we could just sketch it and do it right then and there. So there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. But as long as we all understand what the end result is supposed to look like, again, working as a team, we can, we can manage it and, and get it done the right way. OK, let, let, let me now jump into something. Uh, I, mean, I mean, everybody's been patting their, the, you know, each other on the back now. So, so let's move into slightly more treacherous territory for a moment. Um, owners reps, um, my contention is, by and large, if you have a, an inexperienced client who's building a complicated job, they do need an outside person uh, if they don't have anybody in-house because being a client is a big job. But um, many of us have had some pretty unhappy experiences with owner's reps. And I think that the architecture profession, more than the owners or the contractors, were the ones who, who let this all happen by, first of all, abdicating fear, you know, parts of the role by, by fear of litigation. As you said, lawyers pay, play a more important part. <clears throat> and if you've ever been involved in litigation, I'm sure everybody here has, of one sort or another, it's, it's terribly time consuming and wasteful and just irritating on a good day. Um, on a bad day, it's a lot more painful. Um, so, so on the one hand, I think we as a profession kind of opened the door for this problem. But I think we also opened the door uh, for somebody else to come in and badmouth us as a profession by not being responsible about budgets and schedules. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm asking really two questions. One is, um, what are your views about owner's reps? And, and without naming names, obviously, and like everything else, there's some good and some bad, and we talk about the middle of the curve. And two, if you think it's really unnecessary, how do we convince the owners of that? Because they're the ones that we really have to talk to. Well, when I started in the business, the architect was the master builder. And he was the commander in chief. And we worked for the architect. And uh, over the years, the architects gave up more and more of their responsibility, particularly on the financial side, on the budgeting side, on the coordination side. So we created this new phenomena called owner's reps about 20 years ago. And they've sort of taken over the business. Um, there are some good ones. There are a lot of bad ones. A lot of them play lawyer. They play, uh, they, they, they're, you know, it, it's, it's tough. It's hurt the industry. It's hurt architectural fees. It's hurt, con it's hurt contractor fees. Uh, so uh, it's something we have to live with. So I think what we have to do is make ourselves shorter, sharper and smarter and not leave ourselves open for criticism or for, you know, these people to uh, blame the architect or the contractor for the problems on the job. So you have to be sharp. You have to do good drawings. You have to really work closely with the construction manager and work as a team. And uh, it, 
it's a problem we're all living with now, and it's affecting our pocketbooks. That's what it's doing. Yeah. You know, and, and we're in a we're both architects and contract. We're in a very small margin business, so uh, there's not a lot of room for error in our business. So uh, it's made it even more so the owners rep problem that we're all dealing with right now. I I don't know if you read in the paper the other day, but Apple's profit margin. Uh, in the last quarter went from something like 48% to 43%. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think there are too many contractors or architects who operate with a profit margin like that. We're in a 2% business, pretty much. Well, who Joe, in their right yeah. mind would take the responsibility and the risk that right, we do for 2%? We do for 2%, and that's what we do. So, so okay, so... And the so, architectural fees are even tighter sometimes. Okay, so going forward, how, how do we get out of this position? Joe? Yeah, well, I, look, I, I agree with your perspective. I think um, my, what I see, the ideal owner's rep, and I think there are, there are some good ones. There are some good ones, yeah. yeah. Who view themselves yeah. as responsible for choosing a good architect among good, good architects, a good construction manager among construction managers, and and helping an owner understand the, their roles and responsibilities in terms of making decisions um, that affect the success or failure of the project. And when that, when that happens, it helps us do our job, it helps the architect do their job, and I, and I have no issue. Um, I think what we see is somebody, I'm glad to walk the job with the owner's rep, but we have owner's reps who, one particular job recently, the guy is walking around our job site writing a memo to the owner who's forwarding it to us complaining about things we're not doing uh, in his mind and our project manager was sitting three feet away inside a field office at a construction meeting and all he needed to do was grab him and it turned out that the six points he pointed out, he said the boilers were still in their boxes, he was looking at hot water heaters, not boilers, whatever it was. and. It just caused a level of a flash fire that had to be put out that was, you know, counterproductive and unnecessary. Um, and I think for some reason, and as, as was alluded to, some people like to make themselves look good by making other people look bad. Some people like to show their worth by taking, you know, our money and saying they saved it or Paul's money or Joe's money. Um, and so. I think probably we'd be more successful helping, you know, I don't think we're going to make that level of the profession go away. I think institutions like, you know, for the most part, Columbia hires some owners reps. We work for Columbia University. They have internal departments. We're working for Princeton University. They have good internal departments. For those that don't, I think it's a, it's a model, but maybe working to help shape the roles and responsibilities of the owner's representative, um, which in my mind shouldn't be overseeing the construction or uh, overseeing the design process, you know, necessarily. <laughs> so m m maybe maybe that's the avenue of, of really carving out what are the limits uh, 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 and, 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 and areas where an owner's rep should be involved and shouldn't be involved. Well, I, I think it's safe to say that if you asked any group of architects, do you want to have an owner's rep on this job or not, um, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who says yes. And I think if you asked a contractor's group, um, you know, you, you'd get the same response. So how is it that two out of three of the parties can't control the other one and get rid of these people when they're not needed? And I agree with you, it's not every case that, that a university or a big museum or whatever has a competent facility staff, but it sure is often the case. Well, and the problem, Paul, is yeah. it, it, it comes back to dollars. Uh, corporate America is convinced that these people are there or watching their pocketbook for them. They feel that architects over design, and they feel that contractors are out to, to rob them. That's unfortunate, but that's what they think. So they bring these people in to watch their dollars. I mean, supposedly they're there to watch the dollars. Uh, so that's the problem. It's a perception that, you know, architects spend their owners' money too freely and that the contractor is trying to take advantage of it. That's the perception. So that's what created a lot of this. And uh, now we, 
this is the problem we have, so. Well, the advertising business is in the business of changing perceptions, and yeah. maybe we should all get together and, and hire advertising people to work on the clients and change their perceptions. I, I don't know how you do yeah, get, I, I, think be, I think specific behavior changes perceptions, that when people see jobs go smoothly without an owner's rep, yeah. and if you can get those people to talk to people, other people, I mean, I, I know in certain cases, um, uh, people have said, well, we, our, our board wants to bring in an owner's rep, and I've fought very hardly, you know, very hard against it, and in some cases actually won. Not many, but in, in a few. The, so the, I don't the, know. Another problem is uh, corporate America is, is downsizing constantly, where corporations used to have large facility staffs and corporate services staffs. They outsource today. So they don't want to carry people on their payroll. They don't want to carry a professional construction guy or a guy who's, who understands architecture on their payroll when they have a project maybe once every two years. So they rather than pay somebody this hundred or hundred fifty thousand dollar year salary, they say, "Fine, when we have a project, we'll bring in an owner's rep." So you know, it, it comes back to dollars. You know, uh, that, but maybe that's, that's maybe we haven't done a good enough job yeah. of of analyzing it factually and producing some facts, yeah. like what does it really cost the owner uh, about having in house versus, sure. let's say, out house um, uh, owners reps. Um, uh, maybe we just need more factual information. Yeah. You know, if you take the old line New York City real estate development firms, they all have in-house capabilities, yeah, they do. and none of them hire owners' reps. Right. It's the new kids on the block, you know, who's been in business for the last several years. They have a few bucks in their pocket, and they're ready to invest it into real estate. Those are the ones that, uh, that bring, you know, the owners' reps in. And so do institutions and not-for-profits who will periodically have a construction project to do and like the corporate America don't have the ability to hire it from within and it's a lot safer and maybe their board of directors even demands that they bring in an owner's rep in. So by default, we've inherited them. Well, I'm, I'm always more optimistic about being <laughs> able to change things than, than the three of you <laughs> sound like you are. Um, let, let me just ask a final question. Um, where do you see, um, you, you know, construction, I, I always say to the students, you know, it's, it's like package delivery just waiting for FedEx to happen. Um, construction is by and large the most backward segment of, it's the largest segment of the American economy and probably the most backward. You know, in, if you look at changes in telecommunications, medicine, anything else like that, you look at the changes that have occurred in the last 10 or 20 years, they're, they're staggering. Um, and you look at the changes that have occurred in construction the last 20 years or so, um, they're not as impressive, let's just put it like that mildly. Um, wh where do you think things could be? We don't, we don't use horse and buggy anymore. And you don't? Very, no, and there's very few wheelbarrows <laughs> on job sites. There. The problem we have, and it's not a problem, you, you need people to build buildings. You can't, the computer can't build a building. So you're dealing with labor. And that's, that's the big issue. You're dealing with labor when you... When okay, in the, in the New York market, the labor market is very controlled by unions and, and who are definitely a, uh, uh, a conservative group in terms of change. But you do also work in other parts of the country, you particularly, Joe, yeah. um, that are not sure. unionized. Right. Um, you know, do, could those areas set an example of a really different way of doing things that, that might be importable to New York. I will tell you, no one builds faster or with more quality or more efficiency than in New York City. We do work in London, we do work in Texas, we do work in Washington, D.C., in Boston. Boston's also a very unionized city. But I will tell you, the quality and the speed and the performance is better in New York than in any of those other markets. Why is that? Because they're trained labor. It, they, they, they go through apprenticeship programs, through journeyman programs, and they, they, they are very well qualified people and they understand how to build and they, they, they know how to meet schedules. Uh, I mean, building in London is a disaster. It takes twice as long as, if you have a, a one-year project in New York, it's gonna take you two and a half years to do the same project in London. But having <laughs> said that, there are still issues. Um, yeah. You know, why is it when you do steam fitting work that you have to have a team? Why do you need two guys or, or, or two women? Um, it 
it's it's an archaic rule that we still uh, are forced to live by. Um, there's certain pieces of equipment that the unions won't allow you to use and prefabricated elements that they won't let us use. And it's been a constant battle. There, there's been some givebacks that started um, around 2008 when the economy dropped. PLAs, yeah. You know, with these project labor agreements. Yeah. But they're not nearly what they could be. They, they, they publicize them as a 20% savings. If anybody gets more than 2 or 4%, um, somebody's doing funny math. It's just, it just uh, not quite there. So a, a huge part of the metropolitan New York area is now non-union, maybe even close to half. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, is it five years out? Is it 10 years out? It's going to break, Paul, and, it, and, and it's going to change. And some of these rules are going uh, to fall. But as far as training and safety, you, you cannot beat the training that, that these union workers get. Yeah? Yeah, I mean... I, I, I can't disagree strongly with what you're saying about advancements in, in you know, techniques. Um, I think there are people exploring the use of robotics um, in construction. Um, late, um, I think prefabrication. We're seeing, you know, yeah. we're seeing some developers exper you know, e experimenting with um, what I call off-site fabrication. You know, mm -hmm. it's not whether it's prefabricated. Yeah. Prior city rat now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I think the limitations of, we've gone from, you know, a unitized curtain wall system versus a stick system, wet seal, and that, you know, not too long ago it was very common to be doing, you know, mm -hmm. a, a field glaze system. That, that's, you're not really not seeing that except, you know, very, very small, yeah. a very small scale. So I guess the question is, What, what advances, because uh, uh, we're not making an automobile. In an automobile, they design several models. They offer some options. We're, we're custom making you know, these projects and buildings. Sure. Everyone's and custom built. Yeah, and so it's, I, I, um, I think uh, safety, we, you know, the, the culture and the attention to safety in our industry has, has changed dramatically. Um, I think the, the, way we deal with each other. Um, we hire a lot, you know, just women in the industry. We hire a lot of women um, in this, that are coming into the construction profession. That's very different than the culture that existed when sure. um, I came into the industry. And um, so I think we're moving in toward a level of uh, civility, um, education, uh, Technology, safety, and so all that to me is moving toward a, a different type of construction industry than we, you know, um, might consider. But I think there are limitations, you know, in large part because we are making uh, very, very, uh, you know, standoff singular projects, standoff pro standalone projects. Well, I always use the analogy of if you made a car the way we make a building, you'd have a. Uh, a three or four million dollar car that didn't work half as well as the least expensive Volkswagen. Um, and maybe the fact that we are thinking of this as such a custom made business is part of the mistake. But the other question is, um, you all know about Fred Smith who invented FedEx and just totally rethought the, the delivery industry and revolutionized it. Do you see the possibility, and if so, how, for not evolving the construction industry as you were describing, which right. it has evolved, right. but revolutionizing it by some entirely different way of thinking about it, either not being custom, not being on-site, not being whatever. I mean, do, do I? And, um, no, I think, I think of, from a process standpoint, you know, I've studied integrated project delivery. And, and, I, and I was going to say know, that. And I've, you know, it, it's not widely accepted anywhere, certainly uh, maybe in California, but certainly not here on the East Coast. But, you know, I think you have to propose and have someone accept very radical um, uh, changes in the way architects, builders, consultants, owners deliver buildings. And, you know, our, uh, Stu mentioned pre-construction. We're involved in pre-construction. 
we're doing the things Stu said, but, but really there's a period of time that we're not being fully utilized. Construction administration as an architect, if we're doing our job, we really don't need an architect walking around making sure we did the mm -hmm. things that we're supposed to already do in our contract. And so when, and that, and that takes time, and while you're designing a building, we can't start anything. So if we're, if we're gonna start to take what would normally be pre-construction and schematic design development phases of construction and say, let's move forward on construction. Let's, you know, let's design the curtain wall system for fabrication now. You know, dur during construction, you know, let's minimize the architect's responsibilities by having as many questions answered. So we're not, you know, RFIs are gonna happen, but if we're going around asking questions that could have been answered before we started, that, that's, that's probably not very efficient. And if it really compressed the time frame in which we deliver projects, then I think people could start to say, wow, this makes sense. You mean, I, I can hire you as a team, architect, construction manager, and consultant team, and I can pay this amount of money, which is the same amount that one of you guys would charge me if I, if I wait you know, you know, 36 months from start to finish, and you can deliver it to the right design, to the right level of quality. And, and if you, you know, if, to me, if you can start doing that where someone can say, well, to your point about FedEx, instead of waiting for a mail delivery, you mean I can get this tomorrow, you know, well, we're not gonna give them a building tomorrow, but if we could really come up with a process where they could take the traditional model and say, in a fraction of that amount of time, for the same cost or less, I don't think, you know, maybe it'll cost less, I, I don't, not so, I'm not so convinced that that's the case, but um, you can control costs, control the product, control the time frame, do a lot quicker, and to, to, to Joe's point, do it in a way that they don't have to hire a, uh, a university doesn't have to have a whole mm -hmm. department of, of um, uh, facilities people where they can work more efficiently and save money. And they could just justify that that's, this is what, a, yeah, I'll, I'll pay $500 a square foot for this building to, and, I'll, and I'll do it with Paul Siegel and, and, and Structure Tone and I want it in 12 months. So like, to me, that would be, I don't know what the answer is, but to me, that would make it exciting and interesting and, 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 and significantly change what we're doing. The problem is, though, you know, the design build doesn't want, no one wants to accept that whole process, especially in this area, you know. It's very tough to sell it. But architects don't want that yeah. because it's contractor-led. It's contractor-led, so right. the architects don't want to be contractor-led on that, so it's, it's tough. And th right, and that's where, but that's where the but I've, I've, but, but. IPD does. Yes, kind of that, that, that allows yeah. for it. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Look, Paul, manufacturing processes have changed dramatically in, in our world in the last 20 years and continues to evolve. You know, steel is all done computerized mm -hmm. and stair framing and, you know, mechanical equipment is made. But one of the problems we run into is manufacturers stock almost nothing anymore. Everything is point. custom. Good point. Know, everything is is 12 weeks, 16 weeks, 18 weeks after you get, you know, shop drawing approval. And, and, and rightly so, no architect is gonna design a successful building and design the next one exactly like the past one. It's gonna recreate it. Well, so Apple, we'll I, I, I've, I've been a big proponent of pay attention to the companies in this country that do other things that are very successful. Apple has been very successful, huge profit margins, and so on by taking the exact opposite approach. Let's not make 50 models, let's make one model of something that is the very best. And they, 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 they study it, they tweak it, they, they, they pour over it endlessly to get the best, very best of its kind. Now, interestingly enough, the, with, the, with the iPhone, now they are selling two, but it's turning out that it's not a very good strategy that the, that the 5C is doing very poorly compared to the 5S. So I, I think that there are um, models in other parts of the world that we're not paying enough attention to. Um, I, we've almost used up our time, um, and I know most of you have to get to studio in a few minutes. Do you guys have any questions? This, you will very rarely have another opportunity in your life, here or any place else, to have three guys like these three guys available for questions. Yes. Hi. Um, <laughs> so for those young architects like us who are still in school, who are very much interested in the work of construction people like you guys, can you advise us that we actually go and work for our kids first, which is a nurture type architect, you know, a little bit, so they can be more, I don't know, better marketable to you guys? Or what's your take on young architects who are just entering school? Is there something that we can offer to 
Well, I think, I think obviously, you, you want to be an architect. Uh, my, my point before was, I think you should spend time, maybe a year, working with a construction company. So wow. you understand, you get the practical feet on the ground knowledge of how buildings get put together, how buildings get constructed, and the problems that people have in, you know, in, in this process. But, uh, I mean, and, you know, that, but, I mean, your goal is to practice architecture, right? But maybe, just, yeah, maybe. maybe, that's oh, not, maybe. that's oh, not, I don't, I don't think we should take, I mean, I've yeah. been a very strong proponent of don't take that as an absolute given. I when I asked them, yeah. or the third year students, you know, at the beginning, what do you want to do in 10 years? That, that's what they all yeah. say. But there are many constructive, really useful, remunerative, uh, uh, rewarding things they can do otherwise. And all I've been a big proponent of, as I say, you guys get really tired of hearing me say this, um, <coughs> is take the blinders off and, and open your, your eyes to other possibilities in the world. I was, I was had a meeting at Google uh, about a week and a half ago. And surprisingly, uh, they many of their recruits, people who graduate from architecture and engineering school, go to work for Google and Twitter and Facebook. They never go into the profession. <laughs> it's causing a brain drain in the industry. Every architectural <laughs> firm today is, has a problem with, you know, with competing. Compete, and, with, and competing with them for people because, uh, and, and even the construction industry, it's the young people, for some reason, are, are shying away from the architecture and construction fields to go to work for these new technology-type companies. But, but my point has yeah. been that the education that they receive is not wasted in terms right. of those yeah. opportunities, no. but in terms of uh, uh, analyzing a problem, looking yeah. at alternatives, Critical and so thinking. on. Sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm, I'm personally involved in something right now, which is sort of an invention thing, yeah. and for a topic I know very little about, and I realize it's just like being an architect. You don't really know everything about any one thing, and what you do is you organize other people who do know about those things, sure. and we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yes? Well, actually, wasn't involved in that, but uh, I did see it from the periphery and did a little bit of work on it at, at a point in time. The old one was removed, and I think the biggest problem there was was devising a design that Lincoln Center would be happy with, and working out with the Department of Transportation when they would actually be allowed to shut the street down and, and do the work. Uh, it, it, it's not that big an engineering feat, you know. It's just long span steel. A little bit of expansion and contraction on either end, and try to prefab as much as possible. Yes. Um, you, you briefly touched on the uh, integrated project delivery. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, like a lot of us in school now don't. I mean, we don't even really think in two dimensions that much anymore. And right. So the, the drawings that you end up producing when you're working for a firm are pretty different from the drawings and the models we. Right. A lot of three dimensional stuff. Mm -hmm. a right. Lot of, uh, uh, um, BIM technology. Right. I'm wondering, is that, are we like sort of blind to the, the reality to where construction companies are not interested in engineering like direct 3D model fabrication and building stuff? No, well, t yeah, I mean, to be, I, that's not correct. I mean, I think my point before was, um, uh, not the transmission of information through a model. In fact, I'd say Stu's point about structural steel. Structural engineers and structural steel uh, detailers and fabricators, they've been designing in three dimensions for a while and actually they've been taking three, take, taking three dimensional designs and dummying them down into two dimensional drawings to accommodate the process. Um, uh, I was really talking about a level of technical design where um, the difference between an architect um, designing something that could be fabricated or designing something that can be interpreted by a fabricator like some of the trades that were mentioned, structural steel, curtain wall, um, precast uh, uh, structures, concrete. Um, but I would say the 
the, the good firms and, 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 you know, from a design perspective, when you can be transmitting information to us via a model, that's something we're doing more and more and something we're seeing more and more. In fact, litigation and, 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 and liability is one of the, one of the challenges. We, we have a project where we're, we are being given a 3D model for a building, a $120 million engineering building at Princeton University. Um, I think I signed something that said the model is not the contract documents, the paper documents are, or the two-dimensional documents are. So that's because the architecture profession doesn't want to be responsible for giving you a model that, and the responsibilities that go with that. So, and what's happened, and not particularly in that, particularly in that project, but we do find that the model lags behind the design. So, so you get the 100% the DD documents in two-dimensional form, and the model is following. So it's it's not, um, it's. I think I, I think I think um, refining that process where you're delivering complete and accurate information with a model um, that can be taken and utilized to whatever level you is decided upon is critical, not having a trail behind or not having it be really the information but not really the information because it's not technically the, the, the contract documents. So I think closing that gap is it would probably be a good place to start. I, I think it's a means and methods issue. And, and I don't know that our side of the table is as sophisticated yet. You know, I've, I've been tracking through engineering. We, we haven't done much in the way of BIM at the moment, but I've been tracking this through engineering news record over the years. And, and even when the design is right and the modeling is right, our side of the table has to make sure it gets built sequentially properly. And I keep reading about problems where, you know, something went in before something else should have gone in, and then the whole modeling just fell apart. So, so the problem really isn't how to use 3D. Uh, the, the problem is, is that we haven't put it into 4D. You know, you know, we haven't integrated the model as a time thing as well as a three-dimensional thing. Um, but it, it does seem that if, if it's the construction side that is lagging, somebody's going to come in who's not lagging and, and kill the three of you real fast. Well, yeah. I'm not sure it's really just our side of the table. I think, you know, there's a, there's a whole new, you know, independent group, you know, these, these, these modelers for each of the yeah. entities. And all it takes is for one little hiccup along the way. So it's not completely architecture. It's not completely engineering. It's not completely construction. You know, it could be a little misstep along the way, and, you know, it's kind of like what one of my friends always says. You take a bucket full of honey and a teaspoon full of shit, and you put it in there, you got a bucket full of shit. So that's kind of the problem at the end of the day. And you, are, you are on video, Stu. You do recall that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> no, I think, I think to your, your point, Stu, is the, and not across the board, but there are firms, both design firms and... Um, construction management firms, oh, let's do a, let's do a model. So the design firm is promising a model and they're having it made somewhere, you know, perhaps India or, you know, some other area where they're shipping their design, sending it somewhere, and a model is coming back. I don't think that helps. I don't think that helps. I mean, when the designer and the, 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 the people that are in, in closest to the project are not involved in creating the model, that's not good. Same as a construction manager. Sometimes we get we get what's called the design model. We create the construction model. We do that in house, and we do it with subcontractors uh, that you know, are sitting in the same room. The day that we take the model or the drawings and say, "Oh yeah, we'll give you a construction model. We're going to ship it." You know, I, I just called this company that has you know um, a full staff in some other country, and they're going to get back to me, and it costs me ten thousand dollars. I, I think it's along the lines of, of where, Lou's, where, where, where Stu is getting is that, that that's taking the, the details of the building, in this case the model, out of the hands of the people that know it best. We want, we want our guy coordinating, that's coordinating the mechanical system to be the guy that's sitting in the room and facilitating the coordination of the model to minimize mistakes. Um, so that's going to take time. Um, okay. Sorry. You guys, most of you, not all of you, have to go to studio. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming. And um, I hope this was useful and interesting. And you know my email. And I am open to suggestions, improvements. Um, no product gets improved without 
hearing from the users, and you guys are the users, so do let me know. And I'd like to particularly thank the three of you guys for taking time out of getting our stuff built to uh, come and talk to us about the present and the future. Thank you all very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet Good you. Good to sir. see you. Great, yeah. great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
second proposal. So there's always a possibility of maybe some pillar thing in there. Yeah, we hope not. Yeah, I mean, we're probably ready to go. The way this works is one of two ways. First of all, we have to publicly advertise. So we can't even go out to bid, you know, when the drawings are there. We have to publicly advertise, allow a certain amount of time to set up. Screen.
Yeah, thanks for coming here on Friday. Most of my experience has come from uh, my 10 visits to Japan. Uh, my wife is Japanese, that's how I got sort of involved in all of this. Um, but we would go over sometimes for three weeks or a month, and I would just disappear in the morning, and I would watch and watch, and then I'd come home at like six o'clock, and we'd get a great breakfast in the morning when I got up, a great meal when I got home, and I was spoiled. It was so nice, but it was a great way to, to learn about the city on foot really exp experience it. One of the difficulties, I think, for you guys is, is sort of the language barrier and the relative dearth of material that is out there that explains in English, plain English, you know, what's going on over there in terms of the development process and, and the planning and so forth. Um, I saw the two handouts, uh, the PDFs on the Japanese planning system and the zoning and so forth like that. I'll touch base a little bit on those today, but we have those in Family lives not far from there, and um, you know I, th I think you know you guys are going to have to do some research, and if you haven't already, to see what sort of available, available planning plans and plan documents are for that area, and sort of build on that um, uh, is probably you know a good way to proceed. So I want to just sort of uh, introduce sort of how this is laid out, uh, the country is laid out, really. Uh, four main islands, it's um, 47 prefectures. Prefectures are super important because they do a lot of the implementation uh, of the plan. Um, it's starting to change now, I'll introduce that in a minute, but it's so important to understand how the prefectures operate in the planning regime, how they have traditionally been arms of the central or the national government in planning, um, and that has brought about some very strong uh, changes in Japan. Uh, we can lay the, some of this um, uh, responsibility for the economic mir miracle and the great strides the country has made for the last 80 or, or so years because pr planning has been centralized. But it's starting to change. But the prefectures still play a very strong role. Numerous cities, this is, I think, as of 2011, 
but there's an interesting process that is going on in Japan that has been for the last maybe uh, 15, 17 years where there's been consolidation of metropolitan air, uh, uh, municipalities uh, into larger and larger uh, entities, uh, mainly because of an efficiency uh, type of uh, uh, approach or thinking. Um, this is left over, I, just a good way to mnemonic reference for if you ever need to draw a quick map of Japan. Um, so within the types of cities, there are uh, a few, few kinds. Uh, the core cities and uh, the ordinance uh, cities are the largest. These are designated by population. We have a few special case cities, uh, at least 200,000. Uh, ordinary cities, uh, you get to become a city at 50,000 with permission of um, the uh, higher-ups higher in the uh, governmental hierarchy, towns and villages. And then we have a metropolitan ward city uh, system that operates in um, 20 cities. You guys will be familiar with that very much in the Tokyo metropolitan area where there are 23 wards. Um, if we look at sort of how this lays out, you'll see that at the very top here, we have uh, you know, very, very uh, clearly marked uh, the prefectures. Um, there are, you know, I don't quite understand this. Do you understand? I know that To is for Tokyo, Do is for Hokkaido, Fu is for Osaka and Kyoto, and then Ken is for everything else. Why do they have those? Is it, is it symbolic? So it's sort of symbolic and tied into history. Yeah, yeah, but there's no, there's no hierarchical no, difference to them, right? They're all prefects. 